And if you uh, have something you'd like to know about this Ruby House, uh, I have a young lady here by the name of Laura Dobb, who is uh, uh, head of the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright Preservation Trust. And she knows a lot about this uh, building. And I thought maybe she'd tell you something about it. Sure. And maybe the I could interrupt with a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. We're glad you're here. And um, what a perfect place for a birthday party with someone who is um, so intimately um, connected with this place. And uh, the Roby House celebrated our 100th year last year. Uh, 1910 was the year that the family moved in. 1911 is the year the family moved out. So unfortunately, the Robies were only here for a year. Um, and this house has, has had quite a history and quite a lot of um, changes over the years. So we're working, the Frank Lloyd Wright Preservation Trust is working to bring it back to that 1910 appearance the way your dad left it when he and the crew packed up the, the, the tools and, and hit the road. So, um, so we're in the middle of the living room, the dining room. These really were the entertaining spaces, and it's so nice for me to see the space being used as an entertaining space. So often we bring a group of 20, we say, look around, and then we take them to the next space. So it's wonderful that you're here and we can entertain. Um, the gentleman who this house was built for was a lover of automobiles, as was Mr. Wright. And one of the reasons that people think that this house is the best example of the prairie style that Mr. Wright really came to develop was because of this connection between Mr. Roby and Mr. Wright and their love of technology and their love of forward thinking and, and forethought. And so with that, they built this house that studied all over the world as, as the finest example of the prairie style. So um, I would like to add one thing to that. Um, there are two houses in Hinsdale and Clarendon Hills that are knockoffs. Yes. Right. One is at the corner of Ayers and Vine, yep. and the other is uh, uh, opposite the 12th Fairway at your golf club. So when you go down the 12th Fairway, look to your right and you'll see a knockoff on this. The windows and the flower pots and the long I didn't know that. I didn't know that. That's great. Right houses or no? Oh, well, they look like they're knockoffs. That's been there since I was a girl. I don't know who lives there. So you mean, Bill, that your dad was the contractor who built this for Mr. Wright? Mm -hmm. Yes, he was. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to say one thing. In, uh, in those days, the blueprints were rather rudimentary. Mm -hmm. They were not detailed, detailed like the plans are today. So a lot of what you see was designed and carried out by the various subcontractors in, in, uh, uh, that worked on the place. For instance, they, uh, among other things, uh, Frank Lord Wright wanted that these cross joints doesn't show it in detail. These cross joints are in red mortar. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, right. All over the house and outside. And that gives you a long red line. And uh, incidentally, these um, bricks are known as uh, Pennsylvania iron spot Roman bricks. And they're, I think they're out of, out of style now. Nobody knows. <laughs> And the interesting about thing about the house, and your dad might have had something to do with this, is these bricks are not are not a structural brick. So this house is actually two brick houses. There's the Chicago common brick underneath, and then this brick on both the inside and the outside that serves as a facade, almost like um, like siding wood. What about, what about the steel work that you told me about? In line with the brick work, the, um, there was a certain uh, artisan brick mason who would do the face work and then the backup the common brick was um, put in by uh, artisans that weren't as uh, expert as the mason and they called them back lumpers 
<laughs> so this house is one of the first houses built using industrial grade steel. You were just talking about the steel. And that's what makes the cantilevered roof over the west porch possible. There's nothing holding up the ends. It simply sort of hangs out there like a diving board. When I talk to kids, that's how I explain it. It's like a diving board. There are steel beams that run the length of the building, and there are also steel beams that run the width of the building. This woodwork here outlines where there's a steel beam all the way through, through, this, through this room. When you're on the lower level, the ceiling is flat, and then it comes down, and then goes back up. That's also showing you where the steel beams are. Mr. Wright believed in truth and architecture, honesty and architecture. So typically when you see some sort of ornamentation, there's a reason. He's trying to tell you something. And in this case, he's really just showing off that use of the industrial grade steel. The structural steel uh, had no particular uh, drawing devoted to it. So it was a, uh, my father working with the steel contractor that designed uh, the connections and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. That's what I heard from him. Bill, did your father build other Frank Lloyd Wright houses in addition to this one? Did your father build other Frank Lloyd Wright houses? No, he, uh, he didn't want to build for Frank Lloyd Wright. <laughs> <laughs> Mainly because uh, he, he uh, had a difficult time getting paid because in the middle of the, the construction, Frank Lloyd Wright went to Europe with somebody. Mm -hmm. yeah, I heard that. <laughs> the ladies all yes. were yeah. loving Frank. Yeah. <laughs> and this house actually was completed by Mr. Barnard's dad and um, someone that Mr. Wright asked to help complete the house. It, what, he wasn't here when the house was finished. And there are a few pieces in the house that, that demonstrate that. So we're bringing the house back to 1910 when the family lived here. And some of you came up the stairs with the handrail, mm -hmm. and there's that weird step up on both sides. It's sort of odd, doesn't seem like it should be there. And that's because they opened up a wall. The wall between the guest bedroom and those stairs was opened up to give the servants easy access to that guest bedroom because Mr. Roby's uh, ill mother was living with them and staying in that room, and he wanted those servants to be able to get to her quickly. So there are some interesting design pieces to this house that aren't necessarily right because he was on to his next adventure. I noticed the where, uh, south of where we live, down toward Lockport particularly, some architect or some firm of architects are creating buildings with this brick and then this horizontal line, concrete line treatment. And it just seems to be mushrooming. Do you know who that is? I'm not sure who that is. Is it a recent builder or...? Well, it's, I've started seeing these things three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. There's a whole town uh, with all the public buildings yeah. built that way. And from a distance, Across across the prairie, right? They really do like you know. They look like uh, Frank Lloyd Wright idea. Yeah. they are no yeah. question. Was, was the, uh, and you can see anywhere where Frank Lloyd Wright was was active. You can see as his career progressed. So did the people who were building at the same time. Hmm. You know, they they originally they thought I'm not building a house like that guy. He's crazy. And then eventually you'd see oh banded windows. Oh, some horizontal feel. Oh, art glass. And all of that was sort of, people were asking for it. They wanted it because it was what was in these homes that were very stylish. Um, but can be, can be challenging to live in. And I think they wanted a livable home, so they found people who were maybe a little easier to work with. Has, has anybody found the two windows in which there's a figure of a man? No, we tried. We've been looking. She's pointing. She knows. Yeah. Yep. So there's the windows that triangle. They're the windows right next to them on the side. As the invisible man. The invisible man. Uh, what was that? <laughs> Say that again. Oh, <laughs> That's a funny Yeah. Who are they? Who are they? To build the association with the Rockefeller Chapel. Men who are pictured. Okay. Oh, they're, um, they're simply figures. Just figures, yeah. The association with Rockefeller Chapel. 
So most of our neighbors were not here when this house was built. This is actually the oldest house in the neighborhood with the exception of some of the Victorian houses this way. Part of the reason they built on this lot was because of the World Columbian Exposition and their love of the area, but also Mrs. Roby spent quite a bit of time down here. I think she may have gone to the University of Chicago. Uh, when they built, there was nothing between here and the Midway. It was all prairie. Uh, and most of the buildings surrounding us, with the exception of this one across the street, which is obviously very modern. But Rockefeller Chapel, Ida Noyes Hall, most of those were built in the 20s, where this was finished in 1910. Some of the history of this, um, when I came on the scene, uh, this uh, building was owned by the Chicago Theological Seminary. And uh, they had it in their mind that they wanted to build on this lot. So they were making plans to tear it down, and then all hell broke loose. Yeah. <laughs> and there was a big flap about it. And then, out of the blue came uh, Mr. Uh, Zeckendorf from Webinet came and put up the money and bought the house. And he, he, only he tried to do some other I got to tell you, he did a bad job. But uh, then uh, he donated it to the University of Chicago. And uh, there's one, one thing I remember. Along the way, um, the roof had to be repaired. So the roof, the tiles had gone, it disintegrated. So I found a subcontractor by the name of uh, Mortensen, who yeah. could find a tile and came on the job. He got the job, and uh, one day, I got a call in the office that um, the work had stopped, and I couldn't find out why. And then I called um, the University of Chicago, and they said that, um, well, the men were tearing the tile off. There were a group of uh, Japanese architectural students that came down and thought they were tearing the building down. And so they, they yelled and screamed at these fellows, and they really were worried about these Japanese fellows. So they climbed down and left. <laughs> Until we got it straightened out. Somebody could speak Japanese. <laughs>